Thank you very much. It's uh, Hello Khan College. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? It's really quite, quite a pleasure to be here um, and, uh, and to be inspired also by the talks of the first session. I think, uh, I think that there were a lot of, uh, a lot of very, very interesting messages about, about context and about the context in which we look at things, the importance of classics and, uh, and, certainly, and certainly looking carefully at what stands right in front of you. And so going, I guess, with the theme of, uh, of standing on the shoulders of giants, I guess, I guess this is my giant. Um, so, so this is uh, this is a silkworm cocoon. Um, and so there's uh, the 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 silkworm, the, the the caterpillar, the bombyx mori that spins this kilometer of thread, is uh, is certainly the the giant that I stand on to look at things a little bit differently. And I want to not give necessarily a talk that is focused about the things that we do with this, but but use this as a pretext to talk about, to talk about maybe material that feeds in with maybe some of the things that you've, that you've heard about this morning. And I guess uh, the context is that um, materials today are really designed uh, to be reliable. We, we really kind of get a little bit upset if our phone doesn't work. Um, and they, so they rarely change. Uh, if they break, we, sh we need to repair them, and they're kind of disconnected from living matter. They're very inorganic, and sometimes to make, uh, to make these materials, for the most part, we use non-renewable resources, so something that is very, very oil-heavy, if you will. So green processing, it ties into the themes of green processing a little bit. And so, um, and so there's a, and it's, I apologize, there's a very bad pun. I know that this is, scientists are really bad at making jokes. So, uh, so this is the thread of the talk. Uh, um, <laughs> And, uh, and so, uh, and so this, uh, this is the way that we look at this material. The, 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 excuse, the excuse to think about materials differently is given by the fact that we have this, this magical thread and that, uh, and that it's you know, very, very old, uh, and that we look at it and try, and try somehow, uh, somehow to think what, uh, what, else, uh, what else you can do. And, and so maybe, maybe affect the way uh, the way that we do things and we think about materials in general. And so this is predicated on a transformation that we make of the material. So we start, we start with, that, uh, with that cocoon. We start with the raw material. And basically, uh, you know, my name betrays it. I'm Italian. Um, so I like food. Um, who doesn't? Uh, but, uh, but so we take these, we take the raw materials, we take the, 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 the cocoons, the, the, fibers, uh, the fibers from the cocoons, and we boil them. We boil them like you would make a good, uh, a good dish of pasta, and, which means that you have to put a lot of salt inside the water. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's not only a good, a good practice if you're making pasta to put salt in the water, but we need a lot of salt to break down the fibers here. And to break down the fibers, and then, and then we take this, this, you know, this, this, this thing that comes out, and we take away the salt, and what we're left in, I'm, well, I'm really simplifying the process, but what we're left with is a solution of water and protein, the protein is fibroin, it's the constituent protein of silk. So we get this liquid solution of water and protein, water and protein, uh, so n nothing else. And this is in fact what the silkworm has in its gland, and so it's what, uh, it's what, uh, the, the, it's what the, the, the silkworm uses to, to thread this kilometer long, uh, long cocoon. Um, it's very remarkable from a material standpoint, and so we take, we take this, uh, this, uh, this liquid solution and we use it to generate a variety of material format. They're listed here, it's a laundry list, it's particles, sponges, scaffolds, blocks, uh, films, ropes, things that look like plastic. And so basically, uh, I think the point that I want to make is that we take, we start from that, uh, so that natural product, we go through the the pasta making process, and, and we generate multiple forms of materials. Multiple forms of silk means, some, means things like this. So things like these sheets of plastic that have a lot of optics in them and that project images. You can take these films and pour them on a surface, wait for the water to evaporate, look at the silk crystallize, and then you make these sheets that you see down there, that's, uh, you know, that's, a, that's reflecting tape, like the reflecting tape that you have on shoes or the reflecting tape that you see on, on stop signs. You can make something that is a bit more artistic, so you can make these large sheets that are entirely made of silk that have this, uh, that, that, that contain holograms. Um, and this is all predicated on reshaping the surface of silk 
in a, in, a very, in a very fine way. You can, if you pick your molds differently and you do the same process where you pour, where you pour the silk solution, wait for it to crystallize and you then lift it off, you can do things like micro needles. This is a little micro needle patch. Um, or you can do things that are, that are, that are bigger. You can actually build uh, solid, solid blocks that are mechanically robust like these gears uh, or, these, or these nuts. Uh, you can build silk in tubular form and make these types of things. Again, this is just nothing but silk. Or you can make bigger parts, like molded parts that conspicuously look like a bone. I wonder why. Um, and uh, then mold them into something that maybe doesn't, doesn't scream medical so much, but something maybe like a cup, uh, like you see here in the picture. Um, one thing that happens with making, with making all of these formats is that you can also interface the pure protein, the silk, the silk plastic, with metals and with semiconductors and do, and do very, very unusual things. So in this case, you can put a little bit of metal on, on the films of silk and, and generate sensors. Or you can, uh, you can do unusual, uh, unusual types of electronics by interfacing them. What you see in the top is you see a film of that, a film of silk with some logic gates on them, and one in the bottom you see a film of silk with some electrodes that wrap around, that wrap around a tube. So, um, and, and this I can't, I can't get through a, a talk without showing the, the, the silk tattoo with the LEDs because, because you know that this is gonna be the fashion trend that is <laughs> of the next decade. Um, so, um, but not really. Uh, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so these are the multiple forms. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a variety of forms, and they're condensed in these images so that, so that they, they portray a little bit of what, uh, of what the different transformation from solution to, to material form are. But uh, the important thing, I think, are the functions that you, can, that, that you can give to the material. And the functions that you can give to the material in the specific case of our processing is the fact that you have a material that is sustainable, and, and that is processed entirely, entirely in water. And, and not only, but these materials can be controllably biodegraded. So you can have materials that are very stable for a certain amount of time, or that melt instant, or, or that, or, uh, you know, they're, they're very stable for years, or they melt uh, instantaneously. And, so, and you can control, you can control the, the, the spectrum in between. It's edible and implantable. Um, and the technological, I say that it's technological because the features of the material are extremely, uh, are, are comparable to some, uh, to, you know, to some microelectronic materials. It's very, very smooth. It's atomically smooth on the surface of those films. And so that, that, that allows it to be interfaced with all, you know, the gadgetry of cell phones and, uh, and, and such. Um, and it preserves biological function. And so, and so if you, if you think about it, and I'm going to get ahead of myself just a little bit here, you, you are starting our building block, our magical building block is this solution of water and protein that transforms itself into a variety of materials. If we add to that solution of water and protein something biological, what happens is that during the phase transformation that goes from liquid to one of those forms, the biological compounds are stored and maintained, uh, maintained active inside that form. And so that's very interesting because then you get into, into this space, you know, when you have all these functions and you have all these forms, then pretty much it's a, it, you know, it's a, uh, it, it's a researcher's dream because you can go through the infinite com combinations and permutations of these properties and try to dream up materials that have, that have unusual properties. And so I just want to show you a couple of these things um, and uh, to, 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 maybe, to, to maybe say that when you do have form and function that collide, uh, you have unusual material outcomes. And particularly interesting in the context of, of the protein is the fact that you have a bridge between the technical worlds and the natural worlds. And so, and so one of the things uh, is tunable material properties. And tunable material properties means that in the sequence of three pictures, you have an electrode array that normally is very rigid. And if you make it, if you make it on a film that is that is uh, that is appropriately designed, when you when you uh, when you increase the water content uh, content of the film, you can get these electrode arrays to wrap around curved surfaces. And this is important because you go away from the rigidity of materials, but it means that you can interface to living tissue. Living tissue is pretty non-planar, I would say. So there's a strong image that is coming. I'm gonna I'm gonna zip through it. 
uh, it's, um, uh, it's basically these electrodes that are sitting on the surface of the brain and actually recording signals in vivo. And the, uh, the, the opportunity here is that you can get these, uh, these electrodes to wrap around the folds of the brain. So there you have it, one, two, three, go. Um, and, and let's move to cakes. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the, other, the other attribute that is, that, is particularly, that is particularly interesting is the fact that you can eat this material. Um, and I make a lot of jokes all the time. I say it doesn't taste, taste good. I mean, again, the questionable jokes that the scientist tries to do. But, um, uh, but the point here is, I, and I put up the cake with the gold leaf because, because, because gold leaf is a fancy, is, is a fa fancy uh, uh, garnish for certain types of dessert. If we shape gold leaf, then you can start thinking of, and we go back and think about conform the conformal nature of the technology that we have, then suddenly these things that adhere on irregular surfaces can adhere to surfaces, yes, of biological tissue, but also of food. And what we have shown here is that you can put these little stickers of silk and gold uh, that basically are RFID antennas, they're, they're little tags, and, uh, and they respond electronically differently whether there's bacteria on the, surface, on the surface of the food or not. And you can read that out with, you know, ideally your smartphone. Um, now it's a big instrument, but you know, but you... Um, and, uh, and so it opens up a different, a different context of applications for these types of things where you can have food contact, you can have ingestible things for health monitoring or food safety or smart packaging, like, like is written there. Um, and then you can augment, maybe you can augment uh, your, your, your senses and you can augment also the feedback that you can get from your body. Um, one, of the things, one of the things that we do is we transfer these things, for example, on teeth. This is a collaboration that we have, uh, with, we have with some of our colleagues. Um, and, and we do basic, basically these teeth tattoo, uh, tattoos. And uh, you can have also monitors of, uh, of, uh, of physiological parameters that go on the skin. So you see on the top uh, one of those antenna that is on a molar and on the bottom uh, one of those antenna that is on, is on the forearm. You see that we have this tattoo obsession um, with, uh, with all of the things that we do, that we do in, in silk. And, in all, and I, it, the disclaimer is that that molar is fairly big. It's, a, it's not a human molar. Um, and the other thing that you can think of is, is that I think is unusual from an electronic standpoint is this is work, uh, this is work that we do uh, with, uh, with one, of the, one of the pioneers of a field of electronics that is, uh, that is, um, that is flexible electronics, so electronics that is non-rigid, is to combine the two and actually think of materials, so semiconductors and, uh, and, um, and, and conductor materials that are entirely biodegradable and put them on, on a substrate of material of silk that is also controllably degradable. And so what you see there is you see uh, a circuit that has some ultra-thin film silicon and, and some magnesium as a, as a connector on a film of silk. And there's an inductor there, and there's all the, you know, all the components that you would expect from an electronic circuit, like you know, resistors, capacitors, and inductances, and it works. There's, a wi there's wireless power that goes to this circuit. And then when you put it, when you put it in water, then it just, then it just melts away. So, so it's interesting to actually take something that has, like electronics, that has a very stringent metric on rigidity and performance and actually introduce this controllable variability in it and try to think, uh, try to think of these functions a little, bit, uh, a little bit differently. And just to give you a sense, we made, we made a, small, uh, a small CCD chip no megapixels, I mean, it's very, very uh, few numbers of pixels, but that takes images and then can, can be dropped in a glass of water and just melts away. And technically, you could, you could in fact, eat it. And the same, and the, last, and the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of worlds kind of, kind of colliding in a way is this, this idea of stabilization that I alluded to beforehand. Add something to that water-based solution and allow the material to form in, in your preferred format and then, and then have that biological component stored. And this is the story, this was one of the things that we talked about. It means that these films of plastic, that green, that green uh, little, little round film that you see there is indicative of a, of a silk film with a biological compound that is stabilized inside of it. And this could have enormous implications for the storage of, uh, of biological compounds that need refrigeration, like vaccines, for, exa for example, or, or types of enzymes or antibiotics. And we did some experiments where we stored penicillin at very high temperatures 
without loss of efficacy. We did some experiments where we stored measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines without, uh, without losing any of the potency of the vaccine. So can you imagine that from a global health standpoint, it's very, it's very nice to, for, uh, to think of these applications. And so if I go back, and this is the other obsession, if I go back to this reflective tape, you know, and usually people look at me like, well, who cares about reflective tape? Yes, it's silk, but really, I mean, okay, I can buy a Nike jacket, you know, TJ Maxx. Um, but uh, so, so the thing again here is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the conjunction of all the different functionalities. So that same, that same reflective tape now that is, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is a safety uh, that is a safety feature on, on running gear to be seen at night can actually make your tissue reflective. And the, the image there that appeared with the outline portion is that reflective tape implanted under tissue. And so what happens there is that you can image much deeper than what you could ordinarily. So you can leave behind some beacons that actually tell you how, for example, uh, you're progressing after surgery or, or you're just imaging something that, that is recurring. For example, if you're monitoring malignancies or something of that kind. You can also... Uh, you can also add things, add functions to that same mirror. So while it's, while it's still doing its reflection function, it can also have the addition, in this case, of gold nanoparticles uh, that, that then, then instead of illuminating with white light and getting light back, you illuminate with green light, and now that little patch heats up. And so you have a way to mitigate infection under... Uh, under the skin, or in this case, you know, under the skin of this mouse, uh, there, is, there is that little patch, and it just is kind of like the, the hot and cold patch. If you have lower back pain, then you can put, uh, put these silk patches underneath. Um, and, so, and so that's an additional function. And then the, the third function, and this is probably the, the, you know, the most scientific, uh, you know, there's, there's data here on, on, the, on, the, on the slide. The, the point here that I want to show, and I think that there's a laser pointer here, like, well, check this out, so yeah. Wow. Okay, so, so what happens here is this, this mirror, these are the, you know, the mirror works because it's a bunch of little prisms, and so the light comes back. Uh, we mix in a chemotherapeutic inside this mirror. So there is, there is a, there is a, a um, this, this mirror in, in theory, in theory is, it could be, it could be designed for chemotherapy. Um, as you implant it, then, then the chemo is released. And the surfaces of the prisms change, which means that the reflectivity changes as well. And so the two curves here mean that you release the chemotherapeutic drug and the reflectivity changes, which means that you can monitor how much drug has been released, which is actually a very, a very important thing to do and a very hard thing to do. And the thing on the right that show with the clock shows the, shows the prism surface that is being eroded as the drug is being released. So you get the idea. You can, you can get a lot of things that come together when you put form and function, uh, function together. Silk is our excuse to do that because, because it's very favorable to get all of these things to talk to each other. So unique material outcomes like something that is environmentally interactive, therapeutic, the control degradability, the maybe something that is sensory and so forth means that, means that you have a lot of opportunity and it's really a lot of fun to think about what the next applications could be. And the materials tomorrow will be materials that will repair themselves, that will be predicated as you can, as you've, uh, will be predicated on feeling their surrounding and sensing what is around it, disappearing harmlessly and be, and I think importantly, be sustainable without sacrificing the, the technical functions. We like our gadgets and so we want uh, these materials to perform in this way. And I think that it will influence the way that we look at things and we think about things and the form of the object will not reflect its function. And, uh, and uh, you know, one day, one day once, when we're done and we want the next model of, of a phone, we'll just eat it. Thank you.